As originally formulated, the Maxwell equation summarized a wealth of observations and embodied Faraday's concept of space-filling fields. Um, here they are in several different forms, and they were extracted from uh, experimental results, very much so as <coughs> This was Maxwell's most characteristic contribution, uh, as well as formulating this whole mathematical framework, uh, introducing the displacement current, a sort of dual to Faraday's effect. At first, as a mathematical observation, it's true that in solving the Maxwell equations, it's often convenient to introduce potentials, the scalar potential phi and the vector potential A. The, with the potentials, we satisfy two of the equations, the equation that, say that says that there are no magnetic monopoles, and Faraday's law as identities. These potentials are a redundant parameterization of the fields E and V. Indeed, this is the equation for them. Since B is a curl, its divergence is zero. That's the no monopoles equation. And then the other equation is derived by putting that into Faraday's law. The redundancy is that you get the same fields for any combination of uh, vector and scalar potentials that uh, are modified by an arbitrary space-time function lambda and, the, and taking the appropriate gradients. Maxwell, from the very beginning, was very concerned to treat the electromagnetic field as a dynamical entity, that is, to bring it into the framework of mechanics. We might say that not only was he concerned to unify electricity and magnetism, and then optics, but he wanted the whole thing also to fit together with mechanics. In this connection, he noticed and emphasized the physical significance of those potentials, phi and A, in accounting for the energy and momentum of electromagnetic fields interacting with charges and currents. For instance, those potentials, even though they have this kind of arbitrariness, appear in the energy density uh, when there are charges and currents present in the form of rho times phi times minus the dot product of j and a. What about gauge invariance when those potentials are appearing so uh, explicitly? Well, as you'll find in textbooks, but for later purposes, I want to emphasize it. Uh, when you uh, make that transformation on the uh, phi and A that we made in the pure Maxwell equations, uh, the energy expression changes, all right. Uh, however, uh, the terms, the additional terms, can be argued away either on the basis of charge conservation, that gets rid of this uh, term proportional to lambda, or when you integrate the density over all space and time, uh, you get rid of those gradient terms. So we have gauge invariance, but only after assuming or building in charge conservation and absence of, of uh, effects at infinity. Vice versa, if, if gauge invariance has to be taken as a fundamental principle, then charge conservation is necessary in formulating the laws, as, by the way, in the absence of magnetic monopoles and the Faraday law. That's significant from a modern point of view, because in quantum mechanics, as presently understood, we must start from uh, a higher dynamic 
physics. That is a Hamiltonian or Lagrangian formulation. It's not known how to formulate quantum mechanics otherwise. That means Maxwell's desire to put uh, the equations uh, in a form that they're derived, uh, that where the energy is explicit and out front uh, is absolutely necessary. So in that context, the potentials and their symmetry are basic and unavoidable features from the point of view of modern physics. Therefore, the seemingly recondite property, gauge invariance, has come over time to seem the deepest, most fundamental message of the Maxwell equations. There's an asterisk, along with special relativity, which is much better known. It seems very abstract so far. Uh, and we might ask, what is the physical significance more directly of our gauge invariance? And it has a simple, well, not simple, but it has a direct physical significance. That is, it states the decoupling or the unphysicality of the longitudinal parts of the of the field of the potential of the field represented by uh, the potentials. Remember, we can add gradients, so that's the longitudinal part, and the gradients have no physical significance. They're saying that the longitudinal parts uh, decouple from physics or have no physical interaction with the physical degrees of freedom. So mathematically, this allows us for a conserved current to eliminate the time-like polarized photons, uh, leaving only the instantaneous plume interaction. I'll show how that works mathematically on the following slide. That's absolutely essential for the consistency of quantum electrodynamics, because the time-like polarized photons have the opposite sign of commutators in a relativistic theory. They go with G00 versus GII, so they go in uh, the they have the opposite sign in a relativistic theory of commutators to the uh, space-like polarizations, which include the physical transverse polarizations. And therefore, if they existed as physical particles uh, in quantum mechanics, they'd have to be associated with the opposite sign of the Hilbert space metric. That is, they'd be negative metric, negative probability particles, or as we say, ghosts. Here is how gauge invariance uh, gets rid of the ghosts using uh, the longitudinal photons to cancel them. So we express the uh, current when it's a conserved current in terms of the charge and its transverse part. So we can uh, write down the longitudinal piece, which we're going to try to get rid of. It's coupling. Uh, in terms of the charge density. And then the interaction term, which occurs if you formulate things in uh, Feynman gauge in field theory, or if you just do uh, Green's functions in, in classical electromagnetism. The crucial uh, interaction always occurs in this combination, rho 1, rho 2, minus j 1, j 2, and we have two just two charges in different places, and currents in different places interacting. That can be rewritten using this expression for the current, uh, eliminating the longitudinal part. And then if we uh, use that as a source in the Green's function, or as a propagator, include the propagator for photons in the field theoretic formulation, uh, we see that what we get is indeed no more dangerous longitudinal photon. Uh, the longitudinal photon and the, the time-like photon, which was even more dangerous, have combined into the Coulomb interaction, leaving behind an instantaneous Coulomb interaction, no propagation, uh, and the propagating electromagnetic field responsible.
responding only to the transverse current. So all of electrodynamics is really captured, all of quantum electrodynamics, the basic interaction, and uh, the separation of the physical from the unphysical degree between them is really captured here, and we see how central gauge invariance was. Conversely, we uh, start from gauge symmetry in the context of setting up a Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formulation for a field theory. It leads more or less to the Maxwell equations. So not only are the Maxwell equations gauge invariant, but the equations that are gauge invariant and satisfy a few general requirements are uniquely the Maxwell equations. When I say more or less directly, the things we have to add are special relativity, locality of the interaction, and restriction to terms no higher than quadratic and derivatives. That leads directly to the so-called uh, Maxwell-Lagrangian and uh, the Maxwell equations, including all their classical and quantum content. Moreover, these uh, additional assumptions are not really um, things you can lightly question because uh, locality is pretty much uh, required by relativity and uh, quantum constructing interactive quantum field theories is a delicate process. They're on the verge of having ultraviolet divergences. And so uh, they will not permit you to introduce fundamental interactions that are higher than quadratic and derivatives. So gauge invariance, this apparently obscure mathematical quirk of the, of the Maxwell equations, now is seen to be absolutely central and, in fact, more or less equivalent to the Maxwell equations. You can derive one from the other. Gauge invariance has a marvelous generalization to non-abelian groups, as was discovered by Yang and Mills. What that means is that uh, what were numerical transformation functions, this lambda of x and t, which expressed arbitrariness of uh, physical description, it promoted to space-time dependent group theoretic transformations in an arbitrary uh, group, or actually a compact group in, in the fully developed theory. Uh, the things that these transformations act on, instead of being simple charges, are now vectors uh, in a space, and the fields, instead of being simple numbers, the electromagnetic instead matrices. This, this idea of having a local symmetry is uh, not only algebraic, but has profound geometric meaning, which I'll come to momentarily. Following the same steps as the quantization of the natural equations, in this wider framework now of non-abelian um, gauge transformations, one can construct, after some technical adventures, the non-abelian generalizations of the quantum electrodynamics. These non-abelian generalizations share, and indeed exhibit in an enhanced form, the remarkable features of quantum electrodynamics. The most remarkable feature is agreement with experiment, which I'll elaborate on in a moment. But other ones are where they, in fact, exceed quantum electrodynamics, these non-abelian theories that occur in the description of the strong and weak interactions, uh, have charge quantization or universality of the interaction as an automatic consequence, whereas in the Maxwell equations uh, describing elementary particles, otherwise the relative values of the charges are arbitrary. 